as you know, we're in the midst of a very important election, and we've got a lot of TV and a lot of newspaper coverage of some parties, and we haven't got too much coverage of other parties. Fortunately, uh, we are able to arrange a meeting so that you can come and hear the leader of the Communist Party of Canada, Miguel Figueroa, uh, who's been so kind as to come up to Brampton uh, today, this afternoon, in spite of all the traffic, uh, and, and uh, speak to us about the important issues that are involved in the vote on October 19. Well, I think that everyone knows that he's a leader. Everyone, most of you have heard him before. Um, without further than in, uh, introduction or for the comments, I'll just say, Miguel, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Wilf. Uh, and thanks very much to our candidate here in, in Brampton North. Uh, uh, Comrade uh, Harinder Hundal and the campaign committee for organizing uh, this meeting. Um, I actually love coming up to Brampton and I like coming to the center by the way as well because my daughter is a big soccer player and uh, I wish we had a facility like that in our neighborhood uh, but um, of course I don't have my daughter today and, uh, and whatnot, and I'm not here to talk about soccer. I'm here to talk with you about, of course, the political uh, situation leading up to uh, the elections on the 19th. We are now just about two weeks to go in this election campaign, and um, we can say that uh, even though this has been one of the longest federal election campaigns in history, Still, with only uh, 14 or 15 days to go, the outcome of this election is still in question. And as uh, no doubt you're aware, um, the Tories, Stephen Harper and the Conservatives, have a small lead, but the Liberals are close, the NDP is close, and um, it's still an open question what will be the outcome of, of this election. And before talking a little bit about our party and what we are bringing to the table and what we are offering as an alternative uh, to the mainstream political parties. I do want to talk a little bit about the campaign in general. Um, we uh, have uh, concluded for some time that the Conservative Party under Stephen Harper represents the most reactionary, pro-imperialist, pro-war, misogynistic, uh, anti-democratic government in Canadian history. And that's quite a conclusion to come to. Uh, if there was maybe a case could be made that the government of Iron Heel Bennett, another conservative government, by the way, back in the 1930s, during the last Great Depression, was uh, uh, just as reactionary as this government, but in any case, a government whose role over the past decade or more, well, almost a decade, two minority governments and now a majority government, has been a unmitigated disaster, a catastrophe for working people. Not for everybody, but if you're a worker, if you're unemployed, if you're a young person trying to get an education, if you're a senior trying to live on a meager pension, if you're a single parent or a working woman who's getting you know, less than 70% the income of, of men, if you're poor or handicapped, um, if you happen to be working in a low wage ghetto, in the service sector or elsewhere, relying on part time and temporary contracts and precarious forms of employment, it has been a disaster. If, however, you're part of the 1%, if you're you know, a corporate CEO, if you're a big banker, it's been a very good decade for you. And in fact, this government, in our view, represents those interests. They come to everybody during election times and they say, oh, vote for us, we will, we will serve your interests. But in reality, they serve the interests 
of the biggest sections of, of, of finance capital, of monopoly capital in this country, and international finance capital as well. And that's why, in our view, the defeat of the Harper Tories is priority number one in this election. And we have said that from the outset, that they are the main enemy of working people. They are the main enemy of peace and disarmament. They are the main enemy of our environment, impacted by global climate change and all of the consequences that flow from that. And they're the main enemy of the principles of democracy. And here I'm not speaking about socialist democracy, even bourgeois democracy itself as being increasingly pared down and attacked and undermined. So for all those reasons, the defeat of the, of the Harper Tories is, is um, the first step in trying to win a new direction for Canada. To move Canada in a, in a progressive direction, in a direction that serves the interests of the people rather than the interests of big capital, of the biggest corporations and the big bankers. It is still possible to defeat the Tories, but it's disturbing that the Tories have come back up in the polls. And why have they done that? Well, despite all of their problems, despite the fact that the economy has been struggling in and out of recession, certainly a no growth economy, despite the fact that there's growing opposition to their policies on the environment, on peace, and so on. Despite all of that, including the scandals around the Senate and around the Duffy trial, despite all of that and all of that, they are bouncing back in the polls. And how have they managed to do this? It's very important that we understand how they are doing it. In the middle of the campaign, when they were down, they hired a ringer, they brought in uh, an expert from Australia by the name of uh, Linton Crosby, a hired gun to turn their campaign around. Now Crosby is well known not only in Australia but also having helped, there's the phone going off, thank you very much. <laughs> it's a good, good opportunity for people to maybe turn your phones off so that they don't, uh, they don't ring during the meeting. Uh, unless it's an emergency, of course, and then you have to take that call. Uh, so this Crosby then went to, went to Britain. And in Britain, he helped the Conservative Party there and the Cameron government to get reelected. And now he's here helping Harper. And, and one of his signature tactics that he uses to get these reactionaries elected is to play on fear, to play on insecurity, to promote xenophobia, fear of immigrants, fear of refugees, fear of terrorists, in order to herd people to vote for the, for, for the right wing. And it's not by surprise, really, that since his arrival, we have seen Harper change his tone. How many of you have watched some of these televised debates of the leaders, by the way? Anybody watch them? Yeah? Few people? How many of you watched them right to the end? Well, good for you, because you really have to have incredible patience to listen to these guys right to the end. I found it very frustrating because, um, because the opposition parties really aren't offering, offering very much different from the Tories. But it was interesting in the one debate on the economy when the issue of the refugees coming into Europe, the problems at the Hungarian border and the, those refugees from Syria, some from Libya as well, elsewhere in the uh, Iraq, elsewhere in the Middle East, but mostly from Syria, 
fleeing the civil war in Syria, the question came up about how many, how many refugees would Canada take? And you remember what Harper said in that debate. Harper said, oh, these other parties want us to open up the floodgates to refugees. Like somehow there would be millions of refugees that would flood across our border and take our jobs and, and, and uh, we'd have to feed them and take care of them and it would bankrupt the Canadian economy. When he used the word floodgate, it was done intentionally to scare people. All of a sudden, instead of helping these desperate people who are fleeing conditions of war with nothing but their children in their arms, instead of having a humanitarian view for Canada, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, to help these people, like we have helped refugees in the past, instead to promote fear and loathing um, about, uh, about these refugees. And he has continued along those lines ever since. The Barbaric Cultural Practices Act has been in the news this past week. I don't know if our if folks here are familiar with this legislation, but it was passed uh, uh, in the past year by the, by the Tories to crack down on um, those who practice barbaric cultural practices against, against uh, women or in, the, in terms of the family and so on. It's ironic, it's ironic that this government should talk about barbaric cultural practices. When just this year, a few months ago, the report of the Commission, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came out, which showed that for not years, not for decades, but for centuries, Canada and the Canadian state has had a policy of cultural genocide against the Aboriginal peoples of this country. And that commission made 94 recommendations which this government has refused to implement, a single one of them, and refused to accept the conclusion that there was cultural genocide. And yet we know that that, in fact, is what was done. And if that isn't a barbaric act, I don't know what is. But they want to talk about barbaric acts of others. And they raise the question of the niqab. You know, the veil that, you know, Islamic women, some, uh, sections of Islamic women wear, or the burqa or other types of headdress, to make a big issue about this, to whip up this idea that, well, somehow this is alien to Canadian values. What is alien about that? This is simply a ceremony that people, whether they want to wear a turban or they want to wear anything else, so what? Why? What's the big issue? And in fact, in fact, out of the 400,000 odd people who have gone through the citizenship uh, ceremonies in recent years, less than 1% have actually said we want to keep our, it's part of our religious belief. Why not respect that? Well, there's a good reason why they don't want to respect that and make a big issue about it is because they want to whip up Islamophobia, that we should be fearful of anybody of the Islamic faith. And that's linked to terrorism. These are the terrorists. And yet, ironically, Canada and the US and the other imperialist powers have been working with these same terrorists in the Middle East. Who were our allies when, when Canada and the US and Britain went and attacked um, uh, the government in Libya and overturned it? They were Islamist, uh, uh, Islamist uh, extremist groups, some, of, some tied to uh, Al-Qaeda. Who was behind the attack on, in Syria? ISIS 
and the Al-Qaeda groups, they are being funded by the CIA. They were helped to be organized by the CIA. And the very war that they talk about, this war against ISIS, is a phony war. The US for the past year, and Canada too, has been part of a bombing campaign against ISIS. And what are the results? By their own admission, they have done nothing to stop ISIS. Nothing. In fact, what they're doing is corralling ISIS and encouraging it to attack the Syrian government. That's what they're doing. And in less than one week, since the Russians have come in to help Syria, they have already destroyed more ISIS infrastructure in one week than Canada and the United States have done for the last year and a half. That's because it's, it's, a, it's a phony. And they're, in fact, supporting these extremists. And then they turn around and try and say they're going to defend us from the terrorists. They're playing a shell game to confuse people and to whip up fear and xenophobia, Islamophobia and so on. Racism. That's basically what it is. They're using racism in order to win re-election. And here, the liberals in the NDP, even in that debate, said, oh, Mr. Harper, you're pandering to such backward views. You're pandering to racism. But you know what? Harper and the Tories aren't pandering to it. They're not just playing on racism. They are helping to foment it. They are they have created this, and they did it not just yesterday. They've been doing it for the past decade with all sorts of legislation, all sorts of, of, of um, uh, political histrionics to develop this idea that, uh, that uh, somehow foreigners, you know, uh, um, Muslims, Arabs, that they're the main enemy, so that they could justify supporting the Zionist state of Israel so that they could cut back on immigration, which they've been doing, particularly for families who want family reunification and other forms of immigration, so that they could change the immigration system so that it was oriented just to serve the interests of business, the temporary foreign worker program, where these workers come in and have no rights, they have no benefits, and as soon as the, the companies decide they don't need that worker anymore, they put them on a plane and send them out. It's a patent uh, policy to serve the interests of capital, to serve the interests of business, not the interests of people, not the interests of families, and so on. That's what this government is doing. So when they push that hot button of racism and xenophobia, they're pushing a button that they have helped to create. They didn't say, oh, there's, a, there's a, a button of racism, we'll push it. They have helped to construct that red button, that hot button, and now they're pushing it to get themselves reelected. And it's very dangerous. And it's a path not just to the right. It's a path, in fact, potentially to fascism. And I raise that point of fascism very carefully. Because we don't like to bandy around fascism, like some people say everybody. You know, I, I remember hearing somebody say, my mother's a fascist because she won't let me go to the party. You know? Well, fascism has a real meaning, a scientific meaning. But there is a growth of fascist movements in Europe, which is very frightening. We're not just talking about anti-immigrant groups or racist groups, but overtly neo-fascist organizations that sing songs in praise of, of Adolf Hitler. There are such movements in Europe and they're getting larger. And they're taking advantage of the insecurity of people. People don't know if they're going to have a job. They don't know if they're going to have a, an education or a, a roof over their heads. And then they're saying the problem is immigrants. The problem is Aboriginal people. The problem is, um, um, you know, whatever, whatever target that they, that they want to identify. 
In the United States, they target Mexicans. The problem is the Mexicans taking their jobs and so on. It's an easy tool, and it's a reactionary tool, and it's a very dangerous tool. And that's what the Tories are doing. Make no mistake about it. No? And then they turn around and they say, oh, we stand uh, in solidarity with the rights of women. What a joke. What a joke. This is a government that, in fact, has attacked women over and over and over again, has cut funding to women's organizations, to halfway houses, to rape uh, relief centers, and so on. And now they want to stand in, in defense of women over the niqab. It's nonsense. They're using it as a racist uh, instrument. I want to say, however, that once, we, once we're clear on this question of what the Tories are really up to and how dangerous they really are, then we have to look at what are the alternatives? What are the, what are the options that are being presented to get rid of the Tories and to be replaced by who? So I want to say a few words, first of all, about the Liberals. Justin Trudeau, playing on his family name and the fact that he's young and new face and so on, has come up quite a bit in the polls. And he says that the Liberals will make a real break with the Tories, that they will fund programs, that they will build infrastructure, that they will stimulate the economy and create jobs and so on and so forth. Well, that's certainly different than what Harper's message is. Yes, it's true. But the other side of it, however, is that they say, well, but at the same time, we're not going to rate, raise taxes on the big corporations and the banks. Taxes, by the way, one of the lowest in the entire world in Canada. It's almost a playground for the rich. But he says, no, we're not going to raise taxes, corporate taxes, on, 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 uh, on, on, uh, on these big uh, companies. What we're going to do instead is we're going to go into debt, further into debt. We're going to run deficit budgets. Well, make no mistake about it. Running deficits does add to the debt. And when that debt is paid back, it will be paid back on the backs of the working class and the people with more austerity. So we get austerity from the Tories today, what we've had for the last uh, decade, with cutbacks to health care, with cutbacks to education, to social programs, and so on, laying off government workers, public sector workers, or with the Liberals, a little bit of stimulus now and more austerity later. And whether you want it now or later, it's going to come out of the, the, the pockets of the working class. That's the big difference between the, the Liberals and the Tories. And when you really look at it from a class point of view, it is no difference. And then there's the NDP. What has happened to the NDP? Many in this room probably hist historically have supported the NDP as a left alternative to the parties of big business, the Liberals and the Tories. What has befallen this party? Because really, when you start to take apart their platform, you see that the, that the NDP has actually moved further to the right than even the Liberal Party. They say they're going to balance the budget. They don't say anything about, well, let's, let's look at it closely. Take foreign policy. The NDP, to their credit, say we're going to stop the war in Iraq and in Syria. We're going to take Canadian troops back. Good. But they don't say anything about future wars. And in fact, they still support Canada's mission, helping a fascist government, a fascist regime in Ukraine. They don't say anything about that. And in fact, they don't say anything about Canada's involvement in NATO from which all of this springs. NATO being the most aggressive military alliance on this earth that now feels free to intrude and impose militarily their policies and their interests everywhere in the world. And it's led by US imperialism. 
and Canada is part of NATO. And so the only party, in fact, in this election that calls for Canada to get out of NATO and NORAD is the Communist Party of Canada. We're the only ones who stand up with a clear position with respect to that. But even if the NDP doesn't call for that, where do they stand on military spending? You know, the, U the military budget in Canada today is over $20 billion. $20 billion. That's a lot of money. And a lot of it, most of it, in fact, is connected with our membership in NATO. And yet the NDP says, no, we're in favor of continuing to increase military spending. And in some cases, in fact, in some of the debates in Parliament have said that the, that the, that the Tories aren't spending enough on the military. That's foreign policy. I could say something also about the question of Israel and Palestine, but the NDP has shifted way to the right in that as well. And they've turned their back on the Palestinian people, and they're supporting Israel now. And even some of their own candidates who speak out again in, in defense of the Palestinian people and their right to an independent homeland, their right to self-determination, those candidates have been fired. They have been removed. That tells you a lot as well about where the NDP has gone. But it's not just on foreign policy. On trade policy, the NDP now basically supports all of these trade pacts, including NAFTA. They used to call for Canada to get out of NAFTA. Now they say, well, it's a fait accompli. And they've supported the, the CETA negotiations with Europe. And they have said, in fact, that with respect to this new arrangement, and all of these, by the way, are pro-corporate trade pacts. They don't help working people at all. And as a matter of fact, jobs and development suffer as a result of these trade pacts. It serves the interests of capital. It allows them to move billions and hundreds of billions of dollars around the planet to exploit the resources at a keystroke on a computer. But it doesn't help working people at all and actually works against their interests. But this latest treaty, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Treaty, which is going to cost even more jobs for auto workers and for dairy farmers and for workers in a whole number of other sectors. What has the NDP said? They said, well, we're not committed to this. You know, if we get elected, well, it's still an open question, but they haven't said they're opposed to this negotiation, which is a secret negotiation that Harper and the Tories have been carrying out behind the scenes. Now, the NDP does say that they're going to raise corporate taxes. So that's good. But what have they said? They've said they're going to raise corporate taxes 2%, from 15% to 17%. Well, experts, economic analysts say, probably, probably uh, true, that for every point you increase corporate taxes, it generates $2 billion into the government coffers to pay for things, to pay for education, health care, et cetera, et cetera. So if you raise the two points from 15 to 17 percent, that's $4 billion. Well, it's not very much at all in an economy the size of Canada. Four billion sounds like a lot, but it's really not. Remember I told you that the the military budget alone is over $20 billion a year. So $4 billion is not that much, but it's something. It's something. Except that Mulcair and the NDP also say in the same breath that they are going to reduce the taxes on small business. Okay, so how much is that going to cost? It turns out that the NDP position on reducing taxes for small business is going to cost the Canadian economy $2.5 billion every year. So all of a sudden that $4 billion shrinks to only a billion and a half. It's absolute peanuts. And yet, as I said earlier, Canada has the lowest corporate tax rate virtually of any country 
of the o in the OECD, any of the advanced capitalist countries, and we could easily afford, and they could easily afford, more to the point, the banks and the corporations could afford to pay twice as much in corporate tax rate, and, and they deserve to pay that much because they have been milking our economy for decades and getting richer and richer and richer in the process. The NDP has uh, failed to speak out on a whole number of questions. Even policies that they used to support, they are now staying quiet about. And what that's, what's that all about? It's about their strategy of backing their way into government. That they think that if they don't take uh, positions, if they stay very quiet, that people sick and tired of Harper will just vote for the NDP by default. That's their tactic. And you know what? It's not working. And that's why the NDP is going down in the polls. Because they're not offering a real alternative to Harper. The Tories at least have a plan. It's more of the same. It's more austerity. It's more, but they have a plan. But the NDP has not provided any alternative plan. They've tried to find themselves right in the middle and they don't want to offend anybody. They don't want to, you know, take positions that would get people upset. And that's a recipe for defeat. And it's, a, it's an opportunist error by putting their, what they perceive to be their short-term interests of getting into government before the interests of really moving the country in a new direction and providing a, a, a clear alternative uh, to the Harper Tories. And it's interesting in the course of this debate that both the Liberals and the NDP, even the Tories too, keep talking about the middle class. We're the party for the middle class. We'll help the middle class. Well, let's look at the word middle class. What does it mean, really? What does it mean? It means most of us, ordinary Canadians and so on. It's a terrible word because it's so vague. Who are they talking about in terms of the middle class? Are they talking about working people, the working class? Well, then why don't they use the word working class? They never talk about workers. None of these parties talk about workers. None of these parties um, uh, talk about uh, certainly the working class. They talk about the middle class. And the middle class is an expression to obscure the real class dynamics in our society, right? So there's a middle class, and then there's the lower middle class, and then there's the upper middle class, and you know, and and whatnot. It 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 was a construct that was developed and used widely by bourgeois sociologists, so that people would not think about the real classes in our society, the working class and the capitalist class. That's why where, where that word comes from. And so now you have all three parties in favor of the, of the middle class. There's other words that they don't use anymore, especially the NDP. They never use the word nationalization anymore. They're not in favor of nationalization. They are in favor of the market, of the, of the basically the so-called free market, which we know is not free. It's dominated by big monopolies, by the big banks. It's not like capitalism was in the 1700s or the 1800s. We live in, under monopoly capitalism today. But nevertheless, the NDP has taken a pro-market position and they do not support public ownership and democratic control of anything anymore. They haven't even taken a firm policy against further privatizations. And we know that NDP governments have supported privatizations in the past. So for instance, with respect to our energy and our, uh, our natural resources. It's the Communist Party that calls for public ownership and democratic control of our oil and gas industry and of other natural resource uh, industries. And why is that important? Well, it's important for at least two reasons. Number one, because of the impact of climate change and our reliance on fossil fuels 
we absolutely must transform and transition our economy towards a green economy. We have to do that. And countries all over the world have to do it. And the negotiations that are going to take place in Paris in December are, are, are going to be key to doing that. But what's required is a firm commitment to lower emissions of gas, uh, you know, of fossil fuels in order to address even partially the growing problem of climate change. Many scientists now say that we're already past the tipping point. That even if we were to uh, significantly reduce emissions today, tomorrow, we would still not be able to avoid the impact of climate change. In fact, we're already being hit by the impact of climate change. Look at all of these droughts and extreme weather, you know, super storms and, and, and what have you. Um, uh, uh, flooding, all sorts of problems that are directly connected to climate change. So Canada must change its pattern. We are one of the dirtiest countries in the world per capita in terms of producing uh, a carbon footprint. And yet, how can we transition the Canadian economy with respect to oil and gas until the Canadian people control that resource? Are we going to do it through a carbon tax? Are we going to do it through regulations? Or are we going to beg the, the companies to maybe change their course? No. That won't work. Why? Because these big oil and, and gas monopolies won't stop until they make every last bit of profit to, to fill their coffers. And they don't care about the environment. They don't care about our communities. They don't care about the working class. All they care about is private profit. And so you can't really make a change until we nationalize those resources. But nobody speaks about that question. And it's not an extreme thing. It's not a pie in the sky fantasy. You know, 80% of the oil